Good evening everyone and welcome to our evening Dhamma group. Today I went to teach meditation at McMaster. There was a conference and there's a conference on breaking down borders or something like that. Something about borders. Anyway, they, um, they wanted to have various workshops to bring people together and so they invited me to give a workshop. I gave two workshops on meditation. Teaching meditation is always an interesting thing. Every person is a, is a universe in themselves. We each have our unique personalities. It was most interesting in the each group had about four people. It was a small team. You know, it was teaching hundreds of people or anything. Like four people in each group. I was curious when I asked them about their how, how it went afterwards, what they thought of it. Each one of them had very different um, things to say about it. The same practice, the same teaching in the same room. And each individual had different things to say. Something rare happened. One of them actually said, Right to, my, right to me, I don't think this is for me, she said. I think I, I'm, there are other techniques that I'd rather, I'm more comfortable with. It didn't, she didn't feel like it worked for her. That's rare. It's rare to find someone who says that. I, so I said, well, that's fine. If, you're, if you want to practice other techniques, that's fine. But I would challenge that. Um, because meditation isn't, the, this meditation isn't supposed to be comfortable. Uh, meditation being comfortable isn't a sign that it's working. Uh, it's meant to challenge you. It's meant to force you to actually look at your habits and your ordinary proclivities, your ordinary way of, uh, of inclination, your ordinary inclinations. And this is key. I mean, meditation, there's so many ways we can evaluate our meditation. We can, uh, and, and not all of them are proper, right? If the meditation technique agrees with your, your views and your beliefs, that's not a sign that you should accept it. If it's comfortable, as I said, you, it's not a sign that you should accept it. If it uh, brings you exceptional, extraordinary experiences, that's not a sign that it's proper meditation. These are not criteria by which you should uh, certainly in, in, in terms of insight meditation, these are not the criteria you should use to discern whether your meditation is succeeding. In fact, I think one of the criteria that you should use is whether it's challenging you. Is it questioning? Is it forcing you to question your beliefs and your opinions? Is it forcing you to deal with things you don't normally want to look at? So taking you out of your comfort comfort zone. I think that's a very good criteria because a lot of meditation doesn't do that. It reaffirms, it pacifies, it placates your defilements, including delusion, which is all wrapped up in views and opinions. And while it's true that meditation should bring peace, meditation being peaceful is not even a good criteria itself because meditation's 
there are many many ways we can look at meditation to sort of understand it's not complicated it's not something that should be hard to understand or even hard to discern whether you're practicing properly or whether you're getting something out of it I think the big problem is we um, we can't we overcomplicate and we tend to um, we have selective memory where we, we forget the benefits. You know, one moment we'll be getting good results and so we like the practice, the next moment we'll be getting, you know, we won't be getting good results and so we think the practice is problematic. Doubt is funny that way. You know, it, it makes you forget the, the benefits. But you know, meditation is a simple procedure. When you're actually meditating, it should be quite clear to you the benefits. The problem is when you stop and when you lose track. I mean, the, the importance of having a teacher is that they remind you. Even just being there, when you come to see your teacher, you remember, uh-oh, and he's going to ask me about this and I wasn't mindful. So it, it forces you to stay honest and to stay objective, to just stay with the system, to stay mindful. You know? A teacher who can call you out and remind you to be mindful. There are many ways we can look at meditation. I remember once we went with Ajahn Tong. Um, I can't remember why. I think we were going to see a place, uh, a forest monastery, a, a place that someone was going to donate to us, uh, to him as a meditation center. And so we went to see that, but then afterwards we went to see this uh, this park. The person who was donating the land was very rich and they also had a, a garden that they wanted Ajahn Tong to see and so I remember going with him to see this garden and it had all sorts of trees in it, all, all rare types of trees and, and you know, an incredible amount of money had gone into this huge forest full of exotic trees and, and flowers and meticulously groomed. It was quite a special experience. Ajahn Tong wasn't all that impressed, but he gave a talk afterwards. It's not that he was disdainful, but he was unmoved by it. In fact, he gave a talk afterwards and he said, oh, we went to see this, this garden. And he said, but uh, I think we should, we should, we should consider the, the inner garden. And so that's one very good way of, of relating to the meditation practice. It's our inner garden. It's the cultivation of who we are inside. We have so many so many different aspects of who we are. All these habits that we've built up that to become our personality. And we may never remove or, or you know, just because we become enlightened or if we become enlightened doesn't mean we'll lose that personality those aspects of who we are. But what we do is we do some tending and some cultivating, maybe even some planting of new seeds. But we engage in, in, in cultivating and, and nourishing the garden, and at the same time removing, cutting down, and uprooting all the weeds, all the thorns, all the stuff we want to be free from. So it's quite a simple you know, simple activity, right? But obviously tending a garden is, is not that complex. It's just about tending and caring and cultivating. It's a skill that you have to develop. And meditation is just a skill. It's a simple skill. It should be simple. You know, if you're doubting about your practice, about whether it's bringing results, then perhaps you're overcomplicating it. Because meditation is simple, you're mindful. And you say to yourself, seeing, seeing. In the beginning, it's easy to be skeptical. What is this doing? Even, even um, averse to it. It feels uncomfortable. It, it's not pleasant. It's not familiar. It's not easy. Right? I always remember the days when I tried to learn tennis. I don't play tennis, but 
For some reason, tennis I found incredibly difficult because they were teaching us to serve. <laughs> we had to throw the ball up and then have some special way of whacking it. And I'll never forget how awful it was for me because I was horrible at it. I always think back to that. It doesn't mean that I couldn't learn tennis. It, means, uh, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with tennis. When you begin to practice something, it's not easy. But it's undeniable. It's undeniable about meditation, uh, about mindfulness. That when you are mindful, at the moment when you enter into that, just grasp the object as it is. And that's what's wonderful about teaching all these people, is because they can taste that. They plant these seeds. When we plant seeds in their garden, uh, whether they'll cultivate it. The first thing I said to them when they walked in the room, I'm not sure if it's a good opener because it's not very pleasant, but I said, you know, this isn't a magic switch that you can pull and you sit down and suddenly, poof, fun wonderful things happen. Meditation is a training. It's something you have to work at. And I don't think that's what people want to hear. They want to come in and do a meditation session and say, oh, that was nice, go back to my life. It's not that useful, right? So it's about it's something you have to cultivate. But perhaps I should leave, leave that till the end of the talk because um, let them taste it first. Right? Plant the seed. This is really, um, I think, really important when we talk about teaching and spreading the Dhamma. And this question of whether it's worth it, whether it's beneficial, whether I'm even capable of teaching. Right? What do I know? I'm not the Buddha. Maybe you've done a little bit of meditation yourself and then you, you, know, you talk to someone else and they ask you and they're wondering about it and you think, should I explain to them the meditation practice? I mean, the wonderful thing we have now is we have this booklet and we have videos and we have a lot of recorded material. There's, there's stuff I've written, there's, you can go to Mahasi Sayada stuff so you can hand on or pass on other things. But I think we shouldn't be afraid to try and plant this seed in, in people's minds. I mean helping them cultivate it, mm, unless you're an expert gardener or an expert tennis player, maybe you shouldn't. But you can explain the rudimentary fundamentals of the practice, and you can help plant that seed in their garden, because it's just a moment. If you just get that taste of where suddenly you're mindful, suddenly you're here and now, suddenly you're present, you know, it's undeniable and it's incontrovertible. You will have no doubt in your mind in that moment. You see, it's so easy to doubt afterwards and forget. But remind yourself, I had that moment. There's no question. And bring yourself back to that moment. Because the wonderful thing about mindfulness is it's not an occasional thing. It's an every moment thing. Any moment. Now, okay, I'm going to be mindful again. Does this work? Oh yes, there it worked. You can see every moment. You know, we overcomplicate it and we think about, oh, I've been practicing for days or oh, I've got days left to practice. Am I really getting anything out of this? That's not how you should look at it. That's harmful because it's dealing in abstracts. It'll never work. Because you can't, ex you can't expect things to always be a specific way. And you can't always be mindful. <laughs> But when you are mindful in that moment, it's, a, it, it's a, the most profound, and the most powerful of all acts, just that moment. We liken it to rainfall. Each moment is a drop of water, a raindrop. Meditation is, uh, mindfulness is like those raindrops. But I think that's a bit, mis um, not misleading, but um, well, it, it, it may, may um, I mean, it's an underestimation of the power. Well, meditation isn't water, I mean, it's this incredible, pure substance, and uh, even just a drop of it is like planting a seed in your garden that may one day grow into a beautiful 
or flower or tree, you know, grow into a tree of enlightenment, really. So we focus very much on moments. Anyway, I just wanted to sort of c contemplate this idea of spreading the Dhamma to ourselves. I remember talking to a monk once and and I uh, was talking about spreading the Dhamma and he kept saying to me, he said, spread it to yourself first. I don't think he had a very high estimation of me. And, and you know, with good reason, I should, you know, we have to practice for ourselves. And we spread it to ourselves. We plant things in our garden. We cultivate wholesome qualities in our minds. Whether we help others. You don't have to be an expert gardener to provide people with seeds. And with meditation you provide these moments. Help someone to see, help someone to have that moment of mindfulness. That moment probably won't uh, trigger an, an experience of enlightenment. But it will plant a seed. It will plant a seed in their garden. So we talk about talk about seeds, seeds and gardens. Well, there you go. There's the little bit of dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good.